tools, you will need to pay attention during the entire training. And with this new technology, we do have a way to track it. But one way, easy way you, you can show your participation is in the polls. So please don't uh, hold back and ask as many questions as you possibly can. And I did want to say a big thank you to Bree for getting the CEUs through the approval process. It was not easy, but she is there for you and has done fabulous work. Bree works out of our field office in Johnson City. We also have Jessica Rader. She is our um, great inspector in the Chattanooga field office. And then we also have Tim Hill. He's in the Knoxville field office, and he's been doing optimization for some time in his region with the facilities in Knoxville area. We also have Mark Valencia, and he is our great support out of the Office of Sustainable Practices along with Ali. So that's our team on our end, and we are eagerly awaiting any, any questions you might have that we can send to our presenter. So now it is with my pleasure to partner once again with, um, with, Grant, with Grant Weaver. Um, and bring us this fantastic training on nutrients. Um, Grant has been working across the U.S. optimizing wastewater plants with their operators that lead the charge. Now, Grant is a professional engineer and a licensed operator. He's a rare breed. He loves the numbers and the people. I had the good fortune to work with Grant here in Tennessee since 2014, and today Grant will teach us about biological nutrient removal. Without further delay, Mr. Weaver, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, Allie, I think I need to share my desktop illuminated, and then we can get into my, what just happened. All right. Now, everybody should be seeing um, a picture of Burgess Falls of Cookville. And uh, man, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, it's my return to Tennessee. Uh, unfortunately, I'm still in Connecticut while I'm returning to Tennessee, but uh, I'm going to play like I'm there. I like this picture a lot because it's a beautiful picture. But look at the water down at the bottom. It's green. Um, it's green, and I'm guessing here that uh, at low flows that we have some eutrophication. We have some algae issues uh, in that water body. So it's, I think it's a great picture that illustrates why we're doing this. We're talking about nutrients, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So let me begin, see where it takes us. So we got a series of webinars today. We're going to talk about nitrogen removal. Uh, I'm going to grind and drag you screaming and uh, yelling, uh, but I won't have to hear it uh, through some science and technology. And by the way, there's some 80 folks uh, listening in, so I'm really honored uh, to know that. So you have uh, plenty of company. Uh, next week, we'll talk about phosphorus removal. Uh, and then uh, on the third week, and as Ali said, they're all at the same time the same day of the week, so it should become a routine here uh, for the next uh, seven weeks, almost two months. So then we'll talk about a review on nitrogen and phosphorus and talk about some case studies. It usually gets a lot more interesting for folks as we get into the case studies. And then we're going we're gonna to drill down on some three different technologies. We're going to spend uh, one session on oxidation ditches, one on sequencing batch reactors, and then one on conventional and extended aeration activated sludge. And then what's pretty much always the favorite session when I when I when I do presentations is uh, we talk about your treatment plants. So we're going to talk about several Tennessee wastewater treatment plants, and we'll be talking more about what this means as the sessions uh, unfold. But for now, uh, let's get into it. Oh, um, yes, as Ali said, I love questions. Um, you're going to see there's a lot of questions breaks in here. And uh, when we have a break, I'm going to invite the uh, 
uh, I don't know what they're calling themselves, the moderators, uh, the smart, <clears throat> smart people behind the scene to pepper me with questions and comments. Um, and I'll do my best to, uh, to acknowledge and respond to them in a respectful uh, way. But uh, um, let's start with the science. You can type them in or you can, uh, I, apparently there's technology where you can actually ask. First thing I'd like to talk about in uh, nitrogen removal is when the pH drops too low in the aeration tank, it's basically too low. And so there's a precursor to that that's a real nice tool to measure what's happening to the pH and it's alkalinity. And for those who aren't real familiar with it, I like this simple analogy. Alkalinity is a buffer. So it buffers the change of a wastewater from going to its current condition to a more acidic condition. Not unlike an ice cube in a glass of ice water, which buffers the water temperature change going from cold water to warm water. And as the ice cubes disappear, um, that's a pretty good indication that your water is about to get warm. So an alkalinity, as the alkalinity drops, it's an indication that you're soon, if you don't do something, you're soon going to get a drop in your pH to become more acidic. And the relevance of that's going to become apparent as we get deeper into today's presentation, or hopefully. If not, I haven't done my job very well. Another um, tool that I like is an ORP. Now, not everybody's a big fan of ORP. Uh, I, I am. Uh, I like ORP because oxidation reduction potential, the ORP, is an instrument that from 10 feet away uh, looks identical to a LDO, dissolved oxygen probe. But what an oxygen, dissolved oxygen will tell you is obviously how much oxygen is dissolved in the water, but it doesn't tell you um, what the uptake rate is, what, what the organisms are doing with the water. So if you took these two pictures here, your typical wastewater operator, very busy at work here in the bottom, Homer Simpson, and then an exercise group. In the air, the dissolved oxygen is going to be about the same, right? Our air has, depending upon your elevation, your barometric pressure, it, the air is pretty much the same whether indoor, outdoor, exercising, or sleeping. Um, but the dissolved, uh, but the ORP, if there was such a thing in the air, would be considerably different. It'd be near zero uh, where Homer's sleeping at, at the control panel, and it'd be a much higher positive number in the exercise room. So the ORP is a tool that can tell you how actively the bacteria are breathing the oxygen. And if that isn't good enough, uh, enough of a reason to be interested in it, the other reason is when you get in a DO of zero, it stops, right? Or the ORP continues going negative, and it will tell you how anoxic or how anaerobic the conditions are. And here's a, a chart that I stole from YSI years ago. I really like this. It does a nice job showing that that ORP of zero would typically, in most cases, not always, but typically in most cases, correlate with a dissolved oxygen of zero. So everything to the left of that, all the minus numbers, you can't see it with the dissolved oxygen meter. Now the downside with ORP is it's a bit wonky, takes a while to get used to it, um, and uh, water chemistry matters. In fact, uh, it measures both organic and inorganic uh, relationships. So water chemistry matters. It's not necessarily reproducible from one facility to the next. Uh, even some of the instruments don't always jive up quite as nicely as we'd like. So uh, even though the instruments will read to the decimal points, uh, in my head, I'm always rounding to the nearest 10 uh, at least uh, to get an idea of what the ORP uh, is telling. We'll talk a little bit more about ORP as we go through. But uh, as I promised, uh, I'm taking my first break. Uh, if there's any questions or comments, 
um, certainly uh, do my best to uh, to address them. You got anything coming in, Karina, Ali, or the rest of the team? Nothing right now. All right. I didn't think so, but you know, didn't hurt to ask. So, what the purpose of this whole? How many hours? This <laughs> is 14 hours of of yapping at you. The whole purpose of this is to introduce a new way of thinking that it's not all about the technology. In fact, the way I look at it, there's three basic factors, three principal factors in what affects our ability to treat wastewater. One, obviously, is the technology. And uh, what I'm finding more and more as I get out and about is the flexibility in the technologies that's so important. The second one is the people. Um, empowered operators, and here we're staying with Cookville's our theme. We've got uh, Tom Graham on the left and John Buford on the right. Uh, they've done a fabulous job uh, in uh, Cookville. We'll be talking a little bit more about Cookville uh, in a moment. And then the third leg on the stool, if you will, the third thing that really affects is, of course, the water chemistry. And the way we deal with that is technology and the staff uh, of the dischargers and the pretreatment programs. So what I'm trying to pitch today is, in most cases, operators who are educated, informed, supported by uh, the regulators, the TDEC, and supported by management, uh, there's usually opportunities. And particularly for nutrient removal, my experience is most any activated sludge treatment plant that's removing ammonia can also remove nitrates and therefore get a very good total nitrogen removal. And frankly, the vast majority can make inroads into phosphorus removal, biological phosphorus removal. Um, it's not a direct line. There's some trial and error. There's some mistakes that are made. but. Um, I always like to encourage people to try it before the permits are written because it gives you the opportunity um, to have to push through uh, the learning curve. Hey, Grain. Yeah. We got a first question. I'm pretty excited. How often do we need to change the ORP probes? Well, ORP probes don't seem to last quite as long as DO probes. My experience is they typically last about three years. And one of the nice things about an ORP probe is when it starts to go bad on you, first, if it goes dirty, it just it trends ever more negative, kind of goes, going down the hill, if you will. And if you can't clean it, uh, then it's dead. But uh, Kind of rule of thumb is uh, they'll last you about three years. They cost about a thousand bucks a pop. Good question. DO I think lasts typically lasts longer, five six years. They also cost about a thousand bucks a pop. Anything else? No. All right. Keep interrupting. I love it. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to think like bacteria instead of thinking like engineers. But part of the path we're going to take today is we are going to think a little bit like engineers who created the environments and the habitats for the bacteria. But we're really looking to understand, uh, in a layman's way, the biochemistry, what, what makes the bacteria happy, so we can provide them the environment which will end up getting us the results that we want. Um, Russell Coleman of Athens, I don't know if he's on the line listening in, but uh, we're attributing a quote to him once where he said, uh, bacteria don't have any brains, and if you can't outfigure that, if you can't outsmart them, uh, that doesn't speak very well of his abilities as an operator. And uh, a little tongue in cheek, but it's an excellent point. Uh, they can't jump outside of the tank and read what's written on the tank. They don't read the engineering drawings. They just live for the moment. And uh, uh, so we provide them an environment that that produces 
the conditions that we want and they're going to do it for us. Uh, I think we're going to take a quick break here and kind of get a, a beginning of webinar series and how much do you know about nitrogen. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll climb up for a moment and let the panelists ask the question. Ali's going to start a poll for us, and here I hope you guys participate. It will be one of the things we count towards your CEUs, but it also helps us to think through what do we actually know as of today, and then take a little bit of stock where we rate ourselves. So, Ali, let us know when the poll is ready. Grant, do you need to hand it off to Ali, or Ali, speak up if you need anything. I don't know if I have to do something, let me know. All right. Yes, I just took control and I um, I will do the polls right now. If I can find it. Can you all see the poll or the poll? Ellie, I can tell you that I see all three poll questions. Oh, goodness. And while we're working on that, I want to say, Grant, I don't know if you have time to navigate, but we have about 100 people. So they have really exceeded my expectations. People signed up. I'm really happy to have everyone. I recognize some of the names. And some of them are under code names, which I like too, like call call in user number six. Those those are really good. But then they then there are names, and I want to say we have Doug Nelson online, and I think we have Tony. I think we have Tony. Tony's on too. Yeah. I yeah, we have Tony Wilkerson. So those are our uh, Norris friends. Um, happy to have you guys of course happy to have everybody and it's really nice to see some of our um tdex staff there too we're all learning so we're really excited to be part of this and thank you for asking questions uh we we do want we don't want to know what you want to know so please please do ask so ali back to you how are we doing on the polling well um there's about 31 people who haven't answered the first one. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm not sure how we can see all three of them right now. Um, for those of you who have already answered the other ones, thank you. <laughs> um, but it's slowly, slowly going down. There's 27 now who haven't answered, Karina. What is it they say? If you don't know, you put C. I forgot what the questions are. Mine disappeared. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, they have to answer one of them. They cannot. There is not a catch-all. No, we make them think. We're tough here in Tennessee. So, uh, yeah, we try to, if you would, just do one poll at a time. But it, it's fine with, if you have done what you have done. We'll sort through that. But we'll be looking at the results of the first poll where we are asking you guys, um, about how much do you think you know about nitrogen when we when we start today? So you know, on a on a scale of one to five, you know, five being experts. I I will tell you what I said. I'm not an expert. Now I don't think that I can claim to be a novice anymore. So I was playing it safe and put it at the middle of the scale. So I'm at three, um, and I feel comfortable there. You know, there's a bunch to learn. So, anyways. Um, Ali, I think we're good. Where are we at on the submittal? Okay. I've closed the poll. It just takes a few seconds to uh, to record all of the answers. All right, so soon we should see what we all know. Um, I'm kind of curious what we will end up in the audience. So thank you for answering if you have, and um, don't be shy. You know, we do have some pretty good experts in the audience. Definitely several folks that outrank me hands down.
Yeah. Okay. I will pass this back to pass the presenter ball back to Mr. Grant Weaver. And where will we see the results? And how do we see the results? Ooh. Karina, can you see the results? I cannot. I see Grant's okay. presentation. Okay. I wonder where I need to look. Do I need to look under the polling? Can you see now? I can see it now under the polling. Excellent. Okay. Nobody claimed to be an expert. We have a bunch of humble people in here. Out of 103, we had 14 without answers. And um, maybe one claimed an expert. I don't, you know. But but we have a lot of people in the middle of the road. And then we kind of tend towards the newer audience, newer to the topic. We have about 10 people that sat there at four, level four, but everybody else ranks at three or below. So um, we do have somebody that knows more than, than the average, but most of us tend to be middle and, and the beginning of the knowledge. So that helps you out a little bit, maybe, Grant, if, if you yep. want to bank on that. Yep. And I will stop yakking. <laughs> Your turn. All right. Hand me the screen back and I'll, I'll okay. continue plowing through. Gladly, sir. Here you go. All right, fabulous. So uh, most of us have got something to learn. Hopefully, then, uh, the remaining hour and a half will prove uh, of some value to you. What I'd like to do is do a real quick overview of you know, what a few plants have done in Tennessee uh, without spending really any money to speak of to take their existing treatment plant and get better nitrogen removal. And, and I offer this as enticement and maybe a challenge. I've listed five over here, Cookville, Cowan, Harriman, Nashville, Dry Creek, and Norris. I'm gonna briefly talk about Cookville and Norris. Beautiful picture of Tennessee. Um, here's a Cookville treatment plant, pretty good sized facility. Uh, I've got part of it underneath the little banner here. Um, oxidation ditches. Each of the ditch has six aeration rotors, and uh, it's a facility that's been historically well maintained. And in the last few years, have done the staff there have done a tremendous job. In fact, was it last month's December's? I think um, TPO Magazine did an article about the Cookville staff. And this picture uh, was in that uh, magazine, it featured the, the good work they've done to <clears throat> reduce nitrogen while saving a quarter million dollars a year in electricity. I think the total investment was maybe less than $5,000 in equipment. And they're spending more time and more brain power, uh, uh, Tom and John, especially the two in the center, but the entire staff working together to operate their plant better. And you don't have to be real good at grass to, to figure out what this one's telling you, I don't think. Um, prior to 2015, when uh, they rolled up their sleeves and uh, started making process changes uh, at their oxidation ditches, they were averaging around 15 milligrams per liter uh, total nitrogen. Uh, not that bad. A lot of facilities are running in 25 or higher prior to doing any total nitrogen removal. But now they're they're bouncing not around. They're 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 below five milligrams per liter very consistently for the last what's that one two three four years um, have have done a tremendous job. So they uh, took on a challenge. They challenged themselves to do do better, they learned a lot, they put in timers on those rotors and they're op operating with a lot less e electricity and getting better treatment removal. Now that's a win-win. Norris, Tennessee, much smaller facility, 200,000 gallon per day facility, 
right up by the Appalachia Museum. Um, the facility is basically an, uh, an extended aeration plant with a ring of aeration, steel plate aeration basins around a clarifier that's in the middle. That circle right in the middle is both the aeration basin and the clarifier. I don't know, uh, maybe if, uh, if Tony or Doug want to type in a message for Karina, they can give us an idea if they've quantified uh, their electrical savings. I don't know if they made an attempt to do that, but they are cycling the aeration equipment there on and off and have been for several years. <clears throat> and we don't have any, have very good before numbers. Here's a picture of Tony Wilkerson on the left and Doug Snelson on the on the right. Um, small facility, two very hands-on guys applying themselves, recognized by the state, uh, received an environmental award uh, from the governor in the last, I think it was last year, uh, maybe the year before, for their good efforts. Um, their effluent nitrogen is also right around five. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of historical data on their facility because they weren't doing a lot of permit re uh, required nitrogen testing prior to their work. But I'm sure it was in the 20s, if not higher. So there's a good job. Two facilities, very little expense, supplying uh, that third and I think the most important of the three components of, of how we can optimize treatment technology, uh, change the influent characteristics, the water characteristics, or the people. Um, I want to interrupt. Sure. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. We're talking about nitrate and total nitrogen and all of those things. I want you to maybe talk a little bit about your observations of our ammonia levels in Tennessee as you've worked with the plants. You know, ammonia is the first part of nitrogen, and um, while, while we may be discharging in the 20s or so in Tennessee before we get to optimize, maybe elaborate a little more. All right. Well, um, I'll tell you what. Let's let's do that as we go through the next few slides. What we're thinking. Hey, I want to jump in real quick. Tony says he has seen savings, but not quantified. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, electrical savings there in Norris, but he hasn't really quantified how many dollars per month uh, they're saving. Um, so that's good information too. So let me uh, deal with uh, Karina's point, which is an excellent point here as we uh, go through this nitrogen series. Because what I typically see, the short answer is, is very good ammonia removal. Most every facility I visit um, around the country these days is getting good to excellent ammonia removal unless they're purposefully trying not to. And that's certainly been the case in Tennessee's facilities. So I'm going to show you, oh, 10 or 15 slides here in a moment going through the ammonia getting changed to nitrate, nitrate getting changed to nitrogen gas. The punchline is that last word I use, gas. This is a very different pollutant that we're moving, removing from the wastewater. Everything except for nitrogen and uh, maybe some carbon, when we break it down, it goes off to carbon dioxide in the digester. But other than that, pretty much every, or methane gas leaving the anaerobic digester. Um, pretty much all of our mainline treatment tankage, what it's doing is converting soluble pollutants into bacteria. Actually, a wastewater treatment plant, if you step back and look at, look at it and think about it, other than the primary treatment where we float things, sink, sink things, and the screening where we screen things, it's all about growing bacteria, and as the bacteria feed on the soluble pollutants, as a byproduct, really, they leave clean water. Nitrogen's the one exception. As it goes through the treatment plant, the nitrogen actually escapes as a gas into the atmosphere. 
and we want to manage where that gas escapes. We don't want it bubbling out of our clarifier and popping the sludge in our clarifier and causing us effluent TSS problems. And this nitrogen that escapes into the atmosphere is not polluting the atmosphere. I like to say it's going home to mama because the atmosphere is three quarters nitrogen and only one quarter oxygen. Karina, I'm going to get to your ammonia comment here. Um, I can wait. <laughs> good. So, so there's two steps, really, uh, for nitrogen removal um, in a treatment plant. Um, now, a lot of the nitrogen goes into the sewer pipes as organic nitrogen. Urea, uh, urine is uh, an organic form of nitrogen, but it readily, rapidly, without any operator attention, converts itself to, to ammonia. So from an operation standpoint, I start with ammonia. To convert ammonia to nitrate, we're going to need an oxygen-rich environment. And in fact, we not only don't need the BOD for the bacteria to grow, um, ammonia removal really kicks in if you have a plug flow plant, a long, skinny plant. Um, the ammonia removal will happen in that part of the aeration tank after the majority of the BOD is removed. There's a lot in the literature about how sensitive these bacteria are, and they are sensitive, but my observation, my experience is in most treatment plants, once you dial in ammonia removal, it's pretty reliable. We're getting it year round in northern Montana where it gets extremely cold. So it will survive in cold weather. And the pH, um, typically, unless you have some mountain waters in Tennessee, I think that there's typically enough pH, there's enough alkalinity to keep a pH of in the adequate range. Once the nitrates are formed, and you can see the O gets added on there, then we need to strip that oxygen off and then we get nitrogen gas. That happens in really the exact opposite environment. Uh, it's an oxygen poor environment. It's an organic rich environment. And what we hear is these bacteria are hardier, um, yet this always, not always, most always becomes the more operator intensive part is to maintain consistent nitrate removal. We'll speak a little bit about that here in the next few minutes. So here's what probably, I'm guessing, the vast majority of you are already doing pretty well, is converting ammonia, or if you're a chemist, you'll see that's ammonium, uh, the NH4 instead of NH3. I'm a little geeky that way. so. Uh, most of the ammonia that we see in our wastewater is actually in the form of ammonia. So we add oxygen. Where does that happen? It happens in the aeration tank. And as we do, we consume alkalinity because those hydrogen ions are breaking off of that NH4 as it goes to nitrite. Hydrogen ions are going into solution. We go back to our high school chemistry, pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, whatever the heck that means. But what it really means is the more hydrogen you get going in the solution, the lower the pH, the more acidic. So ammonia going to nitrite is going to create a more acidic wastewater. And to buffer that, the ice cubes, the alkalinity will buffer that. A little more oxygen, and we have nitrate. So treatment plants in Tennessee that are removing ammonia are converting the form of nitrogen from an oxygen-demanding form, ammonia, into an oxygen-rich form, nitrate, but there's still nitrogen in solution. It really hasn't changed the total nitrogen. It's changed the immediate oxygen demand of that nitrogen, but the nitrogen is still available as a nutrient to cause algae blooms. So quick review of that. We're converting ammonia to nitrate. 
My suspicion is most of you are doing that fairly consistently, fairly well, fairly reliably, periodic upsets, maybe during storm events, you get uh, an increase in ammonia, and then once in a while something wonky happens and it goes up. Um, here in the Northeast, um, uh, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Connecticut, we have granite soils, gra uh, very um, low alkalinity in our water, and many facilities struggle to have the pH, the alkalinity available to support ammonia removal and actually have to add a base, some kind of a sodium hydroxide, caustic soda, or something a little less human uh, toxic <laughs> than that, nasty burn type materials. Any questions on ammonia removal before we get to the, the next step? I would like to try something before we get to the questions if folks have submitted. Let me sure. direct you to your participant, um, the audience. I'd like to direct the audience to the participants tab. As you can see under attendees, you have some options like raising your hand or heaven forbid leaving a meeting, okay? But what, what you also have, you have a check mark and an X mark, which is your yes and no button. I would like you to use your yes and no button and answer a question for me on the fly. And my question is, with this 2020 COVID environment, have you experienced increase in ammonia coming to your plants since that is a fairly frequent and strong disinfectant? You know, quats, quaternary ammonia is used for disinfection. Have you seen any increase on your influent ammonia coming in? And try those yeses and nos on me. I really hope it works. I have not tried it before. And if not, then you can speak up. But try, click your buttons, yes or no, the check mark or the X mark, if you've seen increase in your ammonia influence. And I'll give you a minute. Okay, we have, we have no's. We have a couple. We have one. We have one yes. We have lots of no's. Quite a few no's. Okay. So overall, as I'm scrolling through, we have definitely um, no prevailing on that observation on the influent ammonia. That is good to hear. Um, and then somebody's taking coffee. Good. Tim Harrison. <laughs> I have the coffee, coffee emoji there. I'm all for that. I have tea. Uh, we got some yeses, a couple yeses. So it, it probably depends. So thank you very much for answering that question. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Mark uh, Valencia. If you want to look at the at any of our Q and A box, see if we have any questions. We haven't had any questions coming in though. But if you have any, feel free to to throw them in the Q and A, and I can uh, voice them out. Oh. I think we have one. Brett just said, Karina, I think I have seen one plant with sudden increase in ammonia as three schools began caused a WET failure, but in a week it was back low. Thank you for that now. So guys, be on the lookout for it. You know, don't be surprised by it and document it if you can. And, you know, thank you very much, Brett. It's we have, we have seen some of that come through as a notification, so I want to bring a little bit of attention to that. Uh, please ask your questions, and you can ask questions that you like to ask. You do not really have to ask what is on the slides, okay? I have found Grant to be very agile, so we can test him. <laughs> um, <laughs> one, one quick thing, uh, Kenneth was mentioning not being able to see the yes or no option. Kenneth, if you go over to the participants section, so you'll have to click, if you go up to the top of the menu, you'll click participants. Uh, from there, you'll see at the bottom of a check mark or an X mark. That's what you would click as a yes or a no for yourself. All right, great. Are we ready to move on or we got, you know, I'm all for this, so whatever. All right, any other questions? Okay, Grant, it's yours. All right, hearing none. All right, so we've gotten halfway there. Um, 
We've converted ammonia to nitrate that happened in an oxygen-rich environment. And now we need to convert this nitrate into, um, into nitrogen gas. So we're going to start with the nitrate we just created. As I said, the total nitrogen hasn't gone down in our effluent. The ammonia has. So this can require some soluble BOD. The bacteria are going to grow on the BOD. And as they do, the oxygens will go into solution and some alkalinity will go into solution. So think about this for a minute, all right? I'll give you two examples, the good people of Norris and Cookville and how they got better treatment, removed nitrogen by turning their air off, okay? So they spent the energy to put that extra oxygen in to create that NO3, that nitrate. And then by turning the oxygen off, they made an environment where the bacteria who, like all of us, all living forms, will fight to stay alive. If the if free oxygen, dissolved oxygen is not available, many forms of bacteria, not all for sure, but many forms are able to survive by breathing oxygen that's bound up, like nitrate. So they'll breathe that oxygen that you spend all that money on your electricity and blowers or aeration motors, whatever you have, to put into the system. They will now use that. And as they do, the nitrogen will go into the atmosphere, won't be a nutrient in the waterway, to support algae growth, like that opening picture at the bottom of Burgess Falls. Uh, we'll go back home um, to where most of our nitrogen is in the atmosphere. It also gives back half of the alkalinity. So if the water is stressed for pH to support the complete nitrogen process, this denitrification, removal of the nitrate, as a second <laughs> second benefit consumes oxygen use a night box or consumes uh, organics bod using the oxygen you already put in and gives you back half of the alkalinity so we need an environment that's low in oxygen i like to use as a rule of thumb an orp of minus 100 the textbooks tell you you need about five times as much BOD, but think about that. You need the BOD that doesn't happen on days three, four, and five in your bottle. You need the BOD that's going to happen in the first couple hours. So if possible, the stronger the BOD, the better. Now we're getting counter to what we've learned over our careers where we need pretreatment to reduce the BOD down to 250. I like to see a plant at 250 plus. Give me a 500 milligram per liter BOD influent, and I'll show you a better running plant than a 100 milligram per liter influent BOD. Let's try this, Grant. Who yeah. has over 150 BOD? Click a yes on your poll, on your um, on your button next to your name. Um, we'll, we'll give it a minute, and I should be able to get a summary. So give give me a. Give me an answer who has over 150 BOD coming. I can barely hear you. So what 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 are you saying? There's plus 160 milligram per liter BOD and what? Tell me. Yeah, I'm asking the attendees to click a yes if they have over 150 milligrams per liter of BOD coming in. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good click. survey question. Yeah. Yeah, cl click a yes for me. Hopefully we can get this working over. Yeah, it's working. 150. Okay. And I think we're ready. I'm going to look. We have 17 yeses and 20. We have 20 yeses, 17 noes. Yeah. So we do have we have over 20. We have over 20 with over 150 milligrams per liter. That's a really good, really good outcome. We have not found that to be all that easy to get in Tennessee. 
So thank you for answering that. Really appreciate it. So that helps you understand a couple of things. One is during storms, which uh, Tennessee has a lot of, a lot of rain, and a lot of a lot of the systems, the more rural systems, the older systems, have a lot of infiltration and inflow. So during storm events, it's hard to maintain uh, the the ammonia removal. Even harder to remain to control the nitrate removal to retain it. Well, two reasons. One is uh, less retention time, obviously, and another one is the the water that's coming in is so much more dilute that you just don't have the organics to drive the nitrogen removal. And we're going to find in phosphorus, uh, if anything, it's worse, uh, the predicament. So here's a little summary slide, shows some uh, rules of thumb. Um, Things I've found that are, if you can, best ways to dial it in. I don't think I need to read through that. Um, you can see why I like the ORP, uh, because in the nitrate removal step, it's a tool that really lets me understand how, how oxygen deficient it really is. Okay, well, I think we have a, a poll question on the size of the plant. So I think that's Allie's to do that. Am I right? And we're just about a halfway through. So I think we were going to make this one into a little bit of a break so people could get up and stretch their legs for a minute. Am I correct? That's correct. And I'm going to take the presenter ball from you really quickly and, um, and do that second poll. If I can. A quick note too, like when we're answering the yeses or noes, um, someone brought up a good point that you have to clear your previous uh, X or check mark to re-answer. So after you answer and we have acknowledged it, just uncheck or un-X whatever you made so we can uh, leave it clear for the next question in case uh, Karina has another question for y'all. And for the poll at, home, at, at hand, Please do not use item C. There are duplicate C and D, uh, so just don't ignore C and uh, list the. Karina, D. I'm I am uh, I'm trying to change that right now. I'm I'm Far okay. asking new, new answers. We're doing a little dead time here on purpose so people can take a little break. Yes, that's correct too. And we are about at 100 participants. I will also ask whenever people come back to give me a estimate of how many are viewing this uh, webinar with more than one person in the room so we kind of get an idea how many people we might have there um, it's really good attendance i'm i'm really really happy to have everybody yes um this is
Okay, almost done, sorry. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, open poll. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Allie. Sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. All right, guys. So go, go. on this one, we'll give you a couple, three minutes to get it in, and we'll get back to the presentation. So if you would, click one of the options. We have revised it to include the whole range of sizes of wastewater plants, and um, would like to see the representation. I cannot click one. I would like to click, like, all the ones I know, but that's not going to help anybody. <laughs> This is all on you, my dear operators. Hey, Grant, if you would maybe talk a little bit about the background of the breakpoints here. If I would do what? Talk a little bit about the distribution of wastewater plant sizes, maybe in Tennessee, but nationally, you know, the proportion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a yeah. little bit. <clears throat> well, it's pretty interesting because when you're in this business, you read the magazines, you read the journals, you go to the presentations, and, and you you hear about people talking about small treatment plants. And a small treatment plant for so much of what we read and hear about is what? Under 5 MGD? Pretty much um, think that anything below 5 MGD, million gallons a day is a small plant. And 5 to 25 is a medium-sized plant. And over 25 is a, is a big plant. I, I, that's what I would have believed until I really looked at the numbers. And um, it may surprise people, but nationwide, 50% of the treatment facilities, and I'm including lagoons in this, treatment, 50% of the mechanical and lagoons, the average, the median size, half of them are smaller than 300,000 gallons per day. And Karina and I looked at in Tennessee, and we found that that number was very similar. It was right around 400,000 gallons a day. So if you're over 400,000 gallons a day, or 0 0.4 MGD, you work at a big plant because <laughs> you're bigger than average. So um, I think it's a disservice, frankly, to uh, the majority of treatment facilities that uh, that we don't even know that, that they, uh, those are considered tiny treatment plants, but most treatment plants are an equal number. Most treatment plants are less than 500,000 gallons a day or 0.5 MGD. And minority of treatment plants are over half a million gallons a day. was a nice insight. Um, I think it's really important. So, all right, Ali, how are we doing on the submittal rate? I think we may be ready. Good. Let's do that and wrap, and then I'll We'll be on the downhill side of this thing. Yep. So Ali shared the end, uh, the summary. They're ready.
Allie's one of those that took a break, I think. I think she's working on it. It, uh, it, has, it has stopped, but I think we're making it lo really a little harder for her than it needs to be. By <laughs> Sorry, I I had muted myself because my dogs were barking outside and the UPS man showed up. Um, but I have I think I've shared that now. Can you see it? Yes, yes we can. Very nice. Oh, so we have majority of ours are one to ten of the participants, and then we have pretty large plants over ten MGD, and then we have what you know we have we have not as many in the lower range size. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much for submitting the poll. We are good to go. Uh, Grant. Um, okay. Yes, I'll get back yours. to share my desktop and I'll do that. I think that's very interesting results. It shows that why the uh, so much of our publications and the marketing efforts are after the bigger plants because <laughs> the smaller plants, uh, they're at work. They're not uh, able to sit in on a presentation, I guess. All right, so that wraps up the science side of it. Let's do technologies. Now we get to play like we're engineers for a moment. Oh, boy. Um, and to do that, what I'd like to do is talk through a few of the different technologies. Okay, so what I'm trying to do here is I'm giving it some background on why why plants are designed the way they are, what what people were thinking, and then um, in a future webinar, we're going to apply that knowledge to our own plants. Because again, the bacteria, they don't know what kind of plant they're in. They, they don't know, they don't care. Um, well, at least the bacteria I've talked to don't seem to care. So we just want to understand it and then create the environment that gets us the results we're looking for. So if you go logically, since ammonia is first removed, a post-anoxic design, which there aren't too many, and uh, the reasons why there aren't too many become real evident as we go through it. So you get ammonia removal in the aeration tank, converts to nitrate, right? So oxygen, uh, it's consumed, hydrogen ions go into solution, and then the nitrates go into an air off tank, but all the BOD is gone because pretty much by definition, you don't get ammonia removal until most all the BOD is gone. The bacteria that remove ammonia are slower growing than the bacteria that remove the majority of our BOD, and they're going to get out competed. So as the, the end of aeration, we've got very little BOD, but we've got nitrates. So if we're going to remove them sequentially, we've got to add BOD. Another problem in the northeast here would be uh, the pH, the alkalinity would have dropped, and maybe the pH would be so low that we have also have to add some alkalinity source. With the extra BOD in a zero or low oxygen environment, we're going to get the nitrogen gas. Okay, that's a post anoxic denitrification. Um, uh, I've run plants like this, they're very hard to dial in. A little increase in ammonia, and you got to up the BOD. Too much BOD, it bleeds through into the effluent. Here's some targets if you're able to maintain them. Probably no questions on that. If there are, interrupt, but I'm not going to wait. I'm going to assume none. A much more um, traditional uh, approach, a better engineering solution is the MLE process, modified Ludzak Ettinger. Mouthful coming up with those names, but a brilliant concept. So what these geniuses did was they thought, geez, all the BODs coming in, the influent, let's get our ammonia removal in the aeration tank. It goes to nitrates, and we can either ramp up the return sludge concentration to bring all those nitrates back, 
But as we do that, we're going to be pulling so much flow through the clarifier that we're going to blow solids. So rather than that, let's put a pump at the end of the aeration tank where our nitrates are high, our ammonia is low, and let's bring those nitrates back into a low oxygen zone, kind of easy in most plants to have an influent tank that's low oxygen. There's always exceptions. There's plants that have a very robust aerated grit chamber or ones that have a lot of high dissolved oxygen coming in the influent. But most plants don't. The influent's pretty low in dissolved oxygen, uh, maybe even septic coming into the plant. So it's easy to have a low oxygen zone in the front. Simply bring the nitrates back there. They interact with the VOD and the influent, and the nitrogen gas escapes. Pretty simple, brilliant, uh, relatively low cost. You don't need to add VOD. And also, as the um, alkalinity is released in the anoxic zone, that buffer moves right into the aeration tank, which helps with the ammonia removal. So it provides a lot of benefits uh, over the post-anoxic. Now, way too many facilities that have MLE have set their pump rate and walked away from it and not really monitored. And I just want to spend a moment talking about why it's important to pump the right amount back. What we're trying to do is bring as many nitrates back into that pre-anoxic tank as we can possibly get in there without spoiling the environment. You know, it's possible to pump so many nitrates back there that the high DO water that they're in makes that anoxic tank too aerobic. So I like to use some process control tools, try to keep my aeration tank sufficiently aerobic, and try to keep my anoxic tank sufficiently oxygen uh, deplete or anoxic. And I use the ORP to set some targets. So let's, if there is too little re internal recycle, you're going to have a very robust an oxy tank, right? You're not bringing a bunch of oxygen back. So that the nitrates leaving that tank uh, or entering that tank will all, all be removed. So there'll be almost no nitrates leaving the anoxic tank. Okay, that's a good thing. That means the nitrates that came in got removed, but it may mean that there's room to take in more nitrates. And since you're not getting all the nitrates back there. Some of it's going to leak out the back of the plant. If you return too much, what's going to happen is you're getting all the nitrates into the anoxic tank, but the conditions are too much oxygen for the bacteria to do their job. They're going to breathe the free oxygen in that recycled water until it's down to a very low level before they'll work hard enough to breathe the oxygen on the nitrate. I have a quick question. Yeah? What ORP levels are operators striving for? Uh, I think an ORP level of uh, minus 100 in the anoxic tank and a positive 150 in the aeration tank. And when I give you those numbers, that's where you start. Because I gave you that caveat earlier that what number works in one plant may not work in another. So you start there. Start at a minus 100 in the anoxic tank and a positive 150, and then see what that does for you. And by seeing what that does for you is you measure your nitrates leave in the anoxic tank, which should be maybe one milligram per liter, maybe two. If it's down to zero, then then you can then you can work well with a higher ORP, closer to zero instead of minus 100, maybe minus 50. Uh, if you're 
getting complete nitrate removal and keep pushing that up until you you're, get just a teeny bit of nitrate bleed through. Same thing on the ammonia side. If you're getting good ammonia removal at a positive 125, then that's enough air. You don't need, need to put in that extra 25 units of, of ORP. <laughs> So if you if you don't ever touch the pumps, and often the pumps are oversized, this is a very common problem for MLE plants. They're pumping too many, too much water. Um, you're wasting electricity pumping them, you're bringing high dissolved oxygen in there, and it's fouling up the environment in that anoxic tank. So the bacteria will not remove all the nitrates that are coming into that tank. That ORP has gotten too close to zero or it's gotten above zero, and you get too many nitrates leaving the anoxic tank. If you go really crazy, you're actually now starting to bring some of the low DO into the aeration tank, and you're actually starting to remove, starting to impact your ability to remove ammonia. I've seen that. I've seen a plant that was striving. They were running dissolved oxygens of 8, 10, even 12 in their aeration tank, which is almost impossible, uh, because they had the internal recycle rate so high. It was just crazy. They lost ammonia removal. What they needed to do was slow everything down and live within the parameters of the tankage and optimize, maximize their ability with what they have. Any more questions about that? If not, I'll get started on SBRs. Uh, Brett, it looks like Brett was just trying to make quick, uh, have a quick poll with regard to ORP, and he was looking at what ORP are the participants striving for. So I don't know if Corinna wants to do another uh, question with regards to that or not. Um, I think we can try that for a poll that we would have to set up. So let's do it in the next series, Brett. I think it's a good thing. And we'll we'll ask that in a poll form, but we have to prepare it for the next series. Thank you for the suggestion. I assume this Brett we're talking about is Brett Ward, who uh, who could be teaching this class. Uh, any of you have had the pleasure of working with Brett Ward, uh, you're lucky to have access to such talent there in Tennessee. Um, those of you who haven't. Uh, He's a man on the ground. He's a very busy. <laughs> if you can get his attention, uh, you'll get good service. Um, I've also been working with TAUD, getting some great work there out of uh, out of Dwayne Culpepper too. It's been a pleasure working with him. All right, SBR, sequencing batch reactors. Now I want you to focus on this one a little bit because this is what more often than not. Uh, I walk out of a treatment plant encouraging folks to operate it something like an SBR, okay? So this is a real popular tool in my toolbox is to operate your facility in an air on, air off mode like an SBR. So let's understand what an SBR does. And it's one of the few things in our business that's just beautifully named. <laughs> It's a reactor that takes batches of water and runs them through various sequences. You know, they nailed it when they came up with this one. So typically there's uh, two or more SBRs. In a rare occasion, uh, we've been running one for 20 years um, that only runs on one tank and actually has flow through. But in most cases, you've got the flow coming into one unit while well, one or more units is idle. By idle, I mean it's not receiving any influence. It's all going somewhere else. So let's start with the one on the left here, number one. The flow is coming in. The air is on. As the air is on, we're getting BOD removal and we're getting ammonia removal. Ammonia is converting the nitrate during the air on cycle. Flow continues to come in. Oh, just like with the MLE tanks, way too often facilities that have SBRs early on during the setup, cycle times were set and they've never been touched. 
So I'm encouraging you to challenge yourself if you run an SBR to monitor and adjust those cycle times. You don't need to adjust them every day, but seasonally um, there should be some adjustments. So the flow continues to come in. We've, uh, we've uh, removed most of the ammonia so far, it's aerating, ammonia is being removed. Flow continues to come in. We've got all these nitrates. The BOD coming in with the influent is going to provide, or the, the strength of the influent is going to provide the BOD necessary to support the bacteria. When the air is off, the DO drops, the ORP drops. Um, and to stay alive, they're going to work to breathe that oxygen off the nitrate. And as they do, we're going to get nitrogen gas. Cycling the air on and off while it's being filled, this tank will remove ammonia and will remove nitrate. Most facilities are able, once they dial in those cycle times, to get quite good uh, total nitrogen removal. Well, at some point in time, that tank gets fairly full. So it now becomes an idle tank. And as it's idle, we're talking about number one, because all the flow is now going into number two. As it becomes idle, it's like a clarifier, right? So the solids fall to the bottom, the clear water uh, it remains at the top, and you have a sludge blanket. And it'll sit there for uh, a settle time, typically that's programmable. At some point in time, the clear water will get decanted off the top. Some sludge will get wasted into a sludge storage tank. The water level will get drawn back down, and it will be ready for another batch. So the key is to establish cycle times that get you through the transition. If the cycle times were five minutes on, five minutes off, there wouldn't be enough time for the aerobic conditions, the positive 150 ORP, the DO of maybe one and a half or two or one, whatever it is, to drop down to zero enough to go anoxic. So the cycle times have to be long enough, long enough with the air on to reach your air on target for DO ORP and long enough off to reach your targets to create a good environment for the nitrate removal. Yet they got to be short enough so that it's not three days continuous on followed by three days continuous off and you've had 10 cycles of water come in and out of the plant so they didn't even see both of those conditions. So there's there's a sweet spot somewhere in there, and it's typically measured in hours. You typically have a retention time, given all the, all the uh, SBRs in the plant, all of them added together will be 24 or more hours retention time. So you can typically run an hour or two on, an hour or two off, uh, at least during your initial air on and air off cycles. As Karina said, I am I do like crunching numbers. So for me, I would like to put an ORP uh, in the tank. <laughs> I'd like to track the ORP every five to ten minutes, and then I'd like to plot it. And I want to see that it's getting up to my positive 100, positive 150 even, and then that it reaches down into the minus 100. And I would want to correlate those numbers with what the effluent looks like, which would be my way of truing up those numbers. So as I said earlier, this sequencing batch reactor concept is something what Norris has done with their aeration system. They run the air on long enough to get their ammonia removal, off long enough to get the nitrate removal, not off so long 
that they're getting ammonia to slip through the whole plant before that gets the air on again. It takes a little while to figure out the right cycles. Some people luck into it very quickly. Other people, it takes a while. And then, of course, the water temperature changes, and that has a big impact on how long that dissolved oxygen will linger. The water gets cold. When you turn the air off, it takes a lot longer for it to get into the negative ORP than in a warm weather condition. So that's why there's typically a seasonality adjustment that will need to be done. A real bonus, and uh, not a lot said about this, and it's, you know, nothing's 100%, uh, um, but in most cases, cycling condition cycling conditions creating the the mixed liquor uh, not creating uh, subjecting the mixed liquor to aerobic conditions and oxygen deficient conditions you basically are selecting against both kinds of filaments the high do filaments will die in the low do conditions the low do filaments will largely die in the high oxygen conditions so in most cases, not always, uh, but in most cases, you'll have a better uh, performing sludge, a better settling sludge of less filaments if you run uh, some kind of a cycling. Any questions or comments on that? One, two, three. I haven't got any yet, but I'll, I'll jump okay. in if anyone types anything All right. up. All right. Well, here's an oxidation ditch. This one's in Virginia, right at the base on the far side of the Appalachians. Um, very robust, had tremendous success around the country, uh, notably in Tennessee, uh, with some oxidation ditches. Cookville's a great example, there's several others. Um, oxidation ditches, really well suited for total nitrogen removal. Uh, many of them have not been operated that way. And to take an oxidation ditch and make it into a total nitrogen removal machine uh, almost always involves a, a savings in electricity. What happens in an oxidation ditch when it's dialed in horizontally, going around the loop in this picture, um, you'll have an aerobic zone. So if you see this rotor splashing and then you follow the track, you can see the waves in the water. And then it turns, that makes the turn and comes back and comes back around to the rotor. Not so many waves over there, pretty calm. Well, the dissolved oxygen is added downstream, which is going away from the picture towards the mountain. Um, so that's a high dissolved oxygen zone. The rotor at the far end, you can see there's one there, it's turned off. So that's a low oxygen zone coming back. You dial that in correctly, you're gonna have an oxygen rich zone, and then it's gonna come back as an oxygen poor zone. Some facilities, Cookville has actually changed the operations of the rotors so they have a few rotors in operation at a time and then others will be idle and they move around the tank where those air strong and air poor zones are. Other facilities like Cowan which is a smaller tank turns both the rotors off. They run the entire ditch as if it's an air on air off ditch something like an SBR. But what typically happens since it goes around and around the ditch so many times, whether you're cycling the air on and off as it goes around or you've created those lateral zones, you're gonna have an oxygen rich zone where you're gonna create the nitrates and then you're gonna have an oxygen poor zone. And it's gonna travel through these zones over and over. Now, I don't know, but I've heard that in an oxidation ditch at design, the water typically goes around at least six laps around the ditch. I don't know if that's true or not, but it certainly moves around and around a ditch. And if it's managed correctly, you can create an 
aerobic zone for ammonia removal, and then the best anoxic zone is where the inflow would come into the to the ditch. So when I'm tinkering, working with folks and tinkering with one of their ditches, <laughs> excuse me, to optimize total nitrogen removal, I'm going to want the rotor. I'm going to want my influent to go into an oxygen pore zone. I want to use that dissolved oxygen. I mean, that dissolved BOD, excuse me. I want the BOD and the influent to be available to the bacteria that are low in oxygen, the bacteria that need the BOD to drive the nitrate removal. I don't know. I probably bollocks that up totally trying to explain that. Um, Good oxygen ditch dialed in, going to get really good total nitrogen or most. Not that unusual to see numbers of something like five or less. Wow, we get to the end sooner than I thought. Um, hopefully, there's some discussion because uh, I've reached the end of my first session. Um, I can go on, I can find more, open up some more slides. Uh, PowerPoints and get continue the discussion, but uh, I do we want have to... plenty here, and we have a question for you. Okay. Um, one is logistics. As far as are the PowerPoints available, I have to admit that I'm in a possession of this PowerPoint. I would like to put it on our website. So, Grant, do I, do I have your per permission to share it? Sure, you can do that. Thank you. So we will have that for everyone. And the next question is this is from an expert, obviously. Um, Wait a minute. Before you, before you ask this next question, um, can you tell everybody what website you're talking about? Oh, that's a really good thing. Yes, we have the Tennessee Plant Optimization website. Ali will send out a link to you with the recordings as well as the PowerPoint source there on our website. You will find other resources, case studies, and contact about the plant optimization program here in Tennessee. So I'm that pull will be that for your, while you're talking. Oh, thank you for doing that. Um, and we, we don't make it very hard. You can just type in TNPOP and it will come up, maybe not the first option, but it will be one of those coming up. This is good, just hit it and we'll see what comes. Yep. I like live demonstration, here we go. So that's it. Um, it will be on this website for you guys. That way we do not have to bog down the email channels with a bunch of presentations. They are a little big, so we would have trouble emailing them. Um, if you scroll down, there will be case studies, and here under the professional training materials, you will be finding the resources, um, uh, PowerPoints and webinars, okay? okay. Uh, the question we had was, Barden Faux process, question mark? Barden uh, process. Barden process is a $10 way of saying oxidation ditch. <laughs> Um, and we have one more question. Grant, have you ever added BOD to the anoxic cycle in an SBR? Um, okay. Um, uh, yes, let's talk about that. But first, uh, I, I'm oversimplified in the Barden flow. Barden flow is <laughs> a series of aerobic and anoxic conditions, um, which is how I illustrated the uh, oxidation ditch. It, uh, there are other configurations to, to get you to the Barden flow, but from a practical, how it works, it's the same as what I just went through for the oxidation ditch. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple. Um, I. I've, I've worked it from time to time to find some free BOD, all right? Um, we have, we operate a small, we, my company, we operate a small SBR. It's got 100 customers, all on grinder pumps, so it's a very tight system. 
And of the 100 customers, one of the customers produces probably half the flow and loading. And it's a little opera house. And the opera house shuts down in the winter. So all the all the fancy uh, people of uh, central Connecticut that want to go see the, the performances, they're denied that opportunity in December, January, and February, which reduces our, fl our flow and loading. So during those months, we add uh, a carbon source. We add sugar or we add a micro C product. Um, so yes, we add it. We don't dose it in the SBR specifically during the anoxic cycle. We've got it on a uh, on a diaphragm pump, an LMI pump, and it pumps in consist uh, continuously at a, at a given rate. So it's pumping in during the air on cycle and the air off cycle. But obviously, when we really need it in there is during the air off cycle to denitrify. Um, so I've done that, and we also run facility that does have a post D night. We run a couple of them actually, and uh, they're small flows, and it's very difficult, as I inferred, to uh, get the right dose of of uh, carbon, of BOD. So basically, you pick your priority. Is my priority a low BOD, or is my priority a low total nitrogen. If it's a low total nitrogen, we're going to sacrifice BOD from time to time. If it's a low total BOD, we're going to sacrifice poor nitrate removal from time to time. I hope that answers that. All right. Any more questions, Mark? That's all I got. I have a couple here. Um, anybody else has questions, Tim? Do you have uh, any more actually, questions? I see them listed. I didn't scroll down. It didn't scroll down for me. <laughs> okay, go for it, Mark. Uh, David asks, does the primary effluent at our plant need to have a BOD concentration of greater than 150 milligrams per liter to optimize the denitrification process? Great question. All right, now. I'm, I think on my tombstone, I'm going to ask my survivors to scribe inanimate objects that Grant learned to hate during his life. And number one on the list is going to be primary clarifiers. So primary clarifiers were a great idea once upon a time, um, but their time has, in my opinion, you're going to hear people with different opinions. And smarter than me, people with different opinions. But my opinion is, uh, more often than not, a primary clarifier is stealing the BOD that you need to drive nitrogen removal and next week, when we get into it, phosphorus removal. So how much BOD do you really need? Well, it's all driven on how much you need to denitrify. Remember, you got to have enough BOD to feed the bacteria that are going to breathe that oxygen off the nitrate. So a rule of thumb is take your influent BOD, let's say, I mean your influent uh, total nitrogen, say you got an ammonia concentration of about 20. Some of that's going to go to bacteria, just growing normal bacteria in your treatment plant. But let's discount that. Let's take that 20 and multiply it by five, because I need at least five by the textbooks. I'd really like to have 10 if I could. So I need somewhere between 100 and 200 BOD going into the aeration tank to drive the denitrification if my influence 20. My influence 40, all right, pretty simple math. We got to double those numbers. So I don't know how much you need coming out of your primaries, but you need at least five times as much as you have nitrates you're trying to remove. So let's let's not look at the influent, let's look at the effluent. So if your effluent nitrate is now 
10, you need at least 50 to 100 more than what you now have, or you need your environment to be maximized. My guess is you need probably that 160 kind of number that Karina mentioned. It's probably a pretty good minimum for nice, consistent removal. Now, there's ways to supplement that. When we get into phosphorus removal, I'm actually going to talk about recycling some waste sludge back into the system. So if you can bring a little bit of digested sludge in, maybe you're going to bring some soluble BOD in as it breaks down. Um, I like to bypass primary clarifiers. I like to detune them. I like to, well, I like to throw them into the sea, but uh, to the to increase the BOD coming out of the primary clarifiers, you're almost always going to see better nitrate removal if you can increase that BOD. I said enough about my attitudes about that inanimate object, my emotional feelings. So you prefer to have more primary clarifiers? Yeah, you got it. Right. <laughs> um, we have another question coming in. Are we going to get into the effects of higher effluent nitrate affecting CL2 residual and E. coli numbers in a future presentation? <laughs> no, we're going to do it right now. All right, so this is going to take me back. So I'm going to jump out of this and back up way up here. Start with ammonia removal. So what the question I think is, um, it's a good question. So you're saying if you remove ammonia part way, you get this nitrite. And what I've seen is um, if the pH is below 6.45, you're kind of stuck there. You don't get much of this action. So if your pH in your aeration tank is below six and a half, you'll probably get much of the ammonia converting to nitrite, but you won't get very much of it going all the way to nitrate. And they call it nitrite block. Another way that can occur is when you first start up ammonia removal. Say you lost it in the winter and it's now spring. The water's warming up, you weren't you were you were back here. You weren't getting any ammonia removal. Now the bacteria, they're warming up. They're starting to do their thing. We're starting to get some. Well, you don't have enough bacteria yet to make this conversion because there hadn't been any nitrates around for the bacteria that make that conversion to live. So we got to repopulate. It can take a couple. So. You Again, it's not a great law. Now, once you're up and running, bacteria that do this growing and the bacteria that produce nitrites. So once you're there, the pH is consistent. You're going to have almost no nitrites, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, definitely less than 0 0.5, day in and day out, milligrams per liter. But if the problem with nitrites as the questioner uh, knows, uh, was stimulating a discussion is, if you chlorinate this organic form here, nitrites, it's a, it'll grab the, car, uh, the chlorine uh, before it's, uh, it'll bind it up so it's not available as a disinfectant. So, I think it's something like five times as many milligrams per liter of chlorine as there is nitrite. So if you're running at 0.1 or 0.2, uh, you're going to consume a little bit of chlorine um, to take to bind this nitrite. But if the nitrite starts to get over one, two, three, four, you can overwhelm a facility's ability to add chlorine. And you just can't dose enough chlorine, and you're going to lose disinfection. So that's called nitrite lock. 
And I explained uh, the two conditions I'm familiar with, why it occurs. One is if you have a very acidic, low pH condition in your aeration tank, you're only getting part way through, or um, you're just starting up, to, you're recovering uh, from a loss of your ability to nitrify and it's coming back and you're gonna have a temporary uh, problem uh, until things equilibrate. Hopefully that addressed the question and made sense. It was a very good question. We okay. have one okay, more Mark. comment. Oh, yes. Okay, Mark, if you would please type in Ali's email address into the Q&A box so everybody can see it. And I would ask anybody that has more than one viewer or a more than one licensed operator viewing at your site, email Ali the names and license numbers of the participants. So hopefully, Mark, you can get it to everybody virtually. Visually. Uh, I can't right now, but if we... um. If someone wants to share their screen, they can just type it up there real quick. If not, I can read okay. it out. Okay, Ali, why don't you do that for a minute? And I want to say, Kathy, you will be good. You know, we are aiming for one and a half hours. You have definitely spent one and a half hours, so if you have to jump off, go for it. And we really appreciate you being here with us.